Hello everyone and welcome to Sci-Fi Zone where we celebrate science fiction movies and TV shows from the past, the present and the future. I'm here today with Claire and MPS and we're coming to you from the wonderful comic book store of alternate worlds. Let's talk about monsters. Yeah, everybody loves monsters, <laughs> but specific monsters in MPS. He's our monster dude. He's going to talk about monsters, so monster us up, MPS. I only have one word for you people. Godzilla. Oh. Godzilla. Oh. Godzilla. Oh. Godzilla. Oh. I don't know why I'm making that noise. <laughs> I don't know. You're trying to get the flame yeah. more loud or something Yeah, exactly like that. right. More, more along the lines of the fact that Godzilla is, well, the black and white Godzilla. Yeah. And how many films in black and white do you think there were? Lots. Two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a good two. There are only two black and white films that I can, I can reference, the 1954 and the 1955 ones, which were the first two that they shot. Uh, considering that Godzilla holds the Guinness World Record for the longest continuing film series with 35 films. Oh, it beats wow. James Bond and it beats a few others. But That's yeah. crazy. Now, forgive my Japanese pronunciation because it's rubbish, but... Uh, go on, give it a go. Hang on. Oh. <laughs> he just says it oh, in Japanese. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> Haru Nakajima, who was the original monster actor who played in Godzilla mm. in the suits, uh, but he did... 12 consecutive films as Godzilla. Wow. So back in the day from 54 to whenever, I think it was 74, which was one particular era of Godzilla films. There's three or four different eras and they all have different names. Do you know how they motivated him to destroy those cities? They just said to him, hey, just think of a director you don't like and he'll just kick the <laughs> crap out of my <laughs> <laughs> they, they probably said to him, look, What's my sta motivation? start here and lunch is over there. You've got to get to the... To the oh, that was a grouse thing about the movies, of just destroying the cities and stamping over things and wrecking things and all the rest of it. It was, it was awesome. Well, not only did he play Godzilla, he played Mothra in a couple of them oh. as well. So, But didn't play them when Mothra was fighting Godzilla. Not That's a bit tricky. Yeah, that uh, but yeah, he was the longest known actor for playing Godzilla. Uh, and the two black and white films back then were awesome. And like we said, you know, they're all men in suits, mm -hmm. essentially destroying cities and the special effects were pretty okay oh, for that yeah, they time. They were know. really good, yeah. But you watch some of the parts where the tanks are coming in and Godzilla just... <laughs> goes down and goes and next thing you know this whole thing's just melt and cities just com <laughs> almost look like they spontaneously combust mm -hmm. but yeah how much fun would it be being Actually, in they, the suit they, to they, they probably instigated the whole city destruction thing really because you know in later movies like independence day etc etc but um they'll blow up cities on a regular basis but yeah they would have started with the whole toho movies and the gods yeah. everything about destroying cities and people would have thought that's really really cool especially imagine if you're the kind of person that, oh Godzilla's like st stomping over Tokyo. Imagine being a Japanese citizen saying, oh, I live in Tokyo. Oh, yeah. he's going to stand with my house in there somewhere. <laughs> Is his big foot coming down? So. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he, stomping on those, on those sets to do that yeah. would be, in terms of a filmmaker's uh, nightmare, because yes. if you muck mm. up or something goes on, you've got to have sets to you rebuild or, chance, yeah. or, to, yeah. or to hide it or to rebuild or whatever the case yes, is. Exactly. And the suits... They all look different. Uh, each time Godzilla comes along, here's a different sort of look. Mm. Uh, and over the 35 films, we've seen him. We, I think w people say him. I like to say she every so often because in the 1999 film, uh, oh, gave birth. To gave birth. Offspring. Yes, that's so right. So it's a, it's a bit tricky. And it, it f let's talk about the cartoon series for one second. Godzuki uh, <laughs> was Godzilla's. Younger cousin, <laughs> flying, <laughs> flying baby. So cousin twice removed. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So <laughs> and so, it's it's very hard to say what the actual character is, but it is being claimed as an it every so often. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. you're right. Uh, that would make sense because it's all done with nuclear and hydrogen weapons that create Godzilla. Essentially, it's it's a bit sort of confusing as to the science behind it. Mm -hmm. But never mind that. <laughs> But yeah, these, these films, the, the two black and white ones were probably the, the fun, the most fun ones where people are, you know, doing the whole, oh, look, here comes Godzilla. And, you know, the guys as tall as them coming past in the Godzilla suit. Because the other shooting. thing too is like, even though like American monster movies existed at the time, there was quite a lot of them. I'm trying to think of how many had really big monsters. There were some, like, you know, it came from beneath the sea with the big octopus and all the rest of it. But the Japanese Godzilla thing was kind of pioneering in monsters that were that large, that big. And so you, mm. you look at Godzilla and then you look at some of the others and like the three-headed one, which I can never remember the name of, but that's bigger than Godzilla. And Moth, Mothra's, I was going to say Mon Mothra. <laughs> <laughs> Star Wars fan, yeah. <laughs> the wingspan on that was huge. So you yeah. sort of got to look at, at, you know, and if we're looking at a Japanese actor who, who 
uh, Nakajima, he was a stunt person originally. So he had the ability to be able to do certain things a little bit differently than, than some actors. If he was only a five foot something Japanese mm -hmm. guy, then, you know, the <laughs> these other monsters are six, seven, eight foot tall and wingspans and all that sort of stuff. It's just awesome the way they did the special effects. And all the, the buildings and, and vehicles and stuff like that looked like the right size. Yeah. Yeah. You know how you can tell in some of them they don't look right. They don't get the perspective. No. Yeah. Thunderbirds yeah. is a cl classic example. Look, we love the show and everything, but water and fire never looked right. Mm. No. It always looked a little bit weird because the models were, even though the models were a certain size, it just didn't look right. Mm. Here though, in, in these ones, they seem to make it work. Yeah, there's how. nothing worse when a building is burning and it's like a candle flame. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. it's scaled down. So yeah, yeah. absolutely Or the right. building all the things going up, but the flame is huge and it just doesn't make any sense. What it also shows too is that Godzilla had a big impact on Western audiences because it has been remade in recent years, yeah. uh, recent decades actually, from um, Americans, uh, American people. So it hasn't just been a completely Japanese thing, which has been good. Uh, so it, it has a lot of longevity, probably more so than most people even thought at the yeah. time. So. Well, look, there's been 35 movies yeah. produced. There's been 30 produced by the Toho Company in Japan oh. uh, and because they were the ones that created and own the franchise and three Hollywood films so far. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so the new monster series that Hollywood are doing with Godzilla mm. and Godzilla, uh, what was the second one? I can't remember what the second wow. one was that came out recently with King Kong. So the, all those mm. monster movies are gonna become part of that franchise. So uh, yeah. So people are fans of the, actually Godzilla. If anything, when Godzilla appears, instead of thinking, oh my God, I mean, maybe in the early days, it was like, oh my God, he's here to destroy us. Now it's like, hey, he's here to save us. He's a, he's a good guy. Yeah. He, she, sorry. It is a, is a, is a goodie. And uh, so, um, yeah, it's it's It's, it's an whole. interesting shift, actually, that one. Yeah, yeah. So what probably started off, I mean, I don't really know, so correct me if I'm wrong, it started off as being the bad guy, the monsters mm. destroying cities. I mean, it can't be a good thing for anybody. Uh, and then decades later, uh, it's become um, a fan favourite. So, yeah. Well, in the, in the latest version, uh, Godzilla's trying to save everyone from all the other monsters yeah. that are coming through. So yeah. it's... Yeah, How's the that? anti hero. And it just disappears story, under the ocean and kind of. see you later, sunshine, until next time. So yeah. call yeah. upon, call me when needed. Yeah, you're always like a Godzilla symbol in the song, guy. <laughs> so you just king and up she comes. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want to watch a, a fun sort of throwback to, to black and white era, yep. 1954 and 1955, the first two Godzilla films, they're, they're a bit of fun to yep. have. Watch the models. And, and it does actually work. The filmmaking is very clever uh, in terms of it doesn't look like it's a guy in a suit. Uh, there is a couple of moves <laughs> where there's Godzilla's fighting like two different opponents, like he's in the middle like this, and it sort of turns, not like how a monster should, but turns in a certain way, almost to like take this one on and goes, oh, hang on a second, it turns this way. <laughs> and there's, there's some fun bits yeah. in it. Yeah. So enjoy your black and white movies, sit down with your popcorn and... and that's the Watch charm God of Zero. Mm. Very good. God and Zero. while you're doing that and trying to get the pronunciation God right, Zero. which he's sort of struggling with here, right? <laughs> oh, it's all very, very good. Uh, so we're actually going to take a break. So we can actually watch some Godzilla movies ourselves. And we will be back with you right after these messages. Don't go away. Alternate World has been specialising in comics and collectibles for over 40 years. With a back issue collection of over half a million comics covering the golden age right through to latest releases, including signed and slabbed gems. They also have an enormous graphic novel collection, one of the largest ranges of manga in the country, as well as toys, statues and pops, and new items are arriving every Wednesday. Each month, Alternate Worlds hosts its own premium comic day, where all the rare treasures are put on display for inspection and purchase. The store also runs regular tournaments and competitions for both comic and gaming fans. And for local and interstate and international buyers, the Alternate Worlds website features their complete range of products. So whether you come in online or in store, visit them soon. Okay, welcome back to the show. As you can see, we're going through a slight black and white uh, theme here for this episode. And let's go right, right, right back. Uh, to 1927 when the movie Metropolis was released. That movie, can you believe, is going to be 100 years old in eight years' time, which is quite, wow. in, quite crazy. Now, this isn't a discussion about how they made it, why they made it, uh, and its legacy. It's all about um, a discussion about how silent movies still have a place in our society. Because we, I know that there are people out there, younger people probably, who even shy away from black and white movies with sound. This is a black and white movie without sound. And uh, it's if you're a science fiction fan, one film that you should at least see is Metropolis. But of course, there's multiple versions of it. 
uh, out there as well. For myself, and I freely admit this, I actually got into Metropolis and discovered it in the 80s with the Giorgio Moroder version. I don't know if either of you remember that when they came out. Giorgio Moroder wanted to do a restoration uh, of the film, got as many parts of it as he could, because back then it all just disappeared into the ether. Produced an 83 minute version, which is really, really, really short. But to make it watchable for a contemporary audience back in the 80s, he added in rock music from Freddie Mercury, mm -hmm. Pat Benatar, Bonnie Tyler, even Adam Ant, they all had songs put in. And some sound effects, uh, very subtle sound effects, uh, and um, colour, and the colour was mainly tinting, wasn't colourisation as such. They were aware at the time that people were struggling with the idea of silent movies. A lot of people just struggle with it because it's just, a bizarre concept. There's a concept that you, we're not used to uh, dealing with. And I actually uh, watched Metropolis then, and from there, I actually got really hooked into it because even though it was made such a long time ago, the story is still really, really relevant. All about the rich and the poor and how they um, one dominates and um, controls the other. And it's one of those things where uh, when you look back upon it, you go, well, hang on, it's still relevant even today. Um, in the early 2000s, uh, Kino International was able to do a full restoration of a much longer version uh, of the film, ran for 124 minutes and, the, and that to me is the version uh, worth watching. The picture quality is outstanding and well worth having a look at for that and the story all fits in really, really well. But then uh, nine years later, um, they actually found some missing footage uh, from the vaults in Argentina of all places oh, wow. and they found even more footage. The problem was that it was from a 16 millimeter uh, replicated print. So the quality was really bad and really badly damaged. But they inserted it into the story and now you can actually get a version of the film which is only five minutes short of its original running length because it's hard to imagine this, but when the movie was released, especially in America, it was cut to pieces because the audiences just didn't like it. It just wasn't working for them. So, uh, so I've seen that version as well. And unfortunately, the 16 millimeter version footage really stands out. You can tell where it's been put in. Um, so for a complete version of the film, it's well worth looking at, but you can also see why they cut parts out in the first place. That's hence the reason why I actually prefer the uh, the 2001 version, even though apparently some shots are actually in the wrong spot. So the thing about what I wanted to bring up is not to say, hey, this is how they made it all and, 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 uh, and the story behind it, but as to why, if you've never seen it, why you should at least give it a go. Uh, so neither of you have seen the film, I take it, is that right? I have seen it, but it's been a while. Yeah, I've seen bits of it, but yeah. I can't remember when or where, yeah. but it's been a long, long time. Yeah. So. yeah, that's fair enough. The thing about watching a silent movie, uh, which a lot of people sort of struggle with, there's two elements that uh, sort of you have to get used to. One is the fact that their speed frame was actually, instead of being 24 frames a second, was only like 16 frames a second, so speed uh, of movement is a little bit quicker, mm. it's, it's a bit unnatural, so when someone's moving mm. quickly, they seem to move very, very quickly. And of course, being a silent movie, they have, they have to effectively overact. So mm. if you do have sequences where someone's scared, they've got to do the <gasps> thing, because there's no, there's no sound. Uh, and it could, can look a little bit comical, and uh, some people sort of think, oh, that looks just silly, but that's how it was back then, and there are certain scenes where that occurs with Marie when she goes, oh, the big shock thing, which, you know, it clearly is a case of overacting, but that's how they conveyed emotion uh, at that time. And of course, silent movies do actually have sound, it's the music that's that right. goes with it as well. So they're not played in like with a mute on or anything along those lines. Um, but I found that if you do go back and say, tackle the Giorgio Moroder version with the music, with the songs put in, and they're great songs, really, really, really good songs. Love Kills is the one that uh, Fred, Freddie Mercury put together. A lot of them are all very depressing songs because it's a very depressing movie. Yeah. Um, but you still can find that the story comes across quite effectively. And in a classic example of where a science fiction film can predict science fact, there's actually a scene where they use a television in 1927 as a video conferencing device. Right? No one would have thought that was possible back in the time. Yeah. But um, now we do it every day. Joe Fredersen has talked to the guy on the other end of the TV screen and they're having a conversation. And I can't imagine anybody back then thinking that's never going to happen. And of course, it's actually a reality uh, today. One of the things about the silent film um, is that because the focus is almost entirely on what you see, yeah. um, they're meticulous about how they film it. Yep. Um, I mean, I don't have a lot of experience with watching silent films, but um, th it's it, the detail and the and the 
the imagery is just it's clear and it's yep. it's beautiful i think yeah yeah, yeah. and because the idea being in the, in the story and you're thinking this makes a lot of sense where someone who's got a lot of power wants to control all the workers yep. who work below the city and the way they do that is to find someone who all the workers are gravitating to, which in this case is Maria, and then make an artificial version of her, which is where the robot comes from, uh, and get her to control the workers. And, uh, and it's kind of funny because in the, the soundtrack of the movie, which is on LP, the record, um, in a double album they open this way, but in this case the record opens downwards because it has the image of the robot, which is absolutely fantastic. So there you mm -hmm. go. We're almost about to run out of time. Yeah. Do you have anything you wanted to add to win? I was going to ask, if you made it today, would you make it as a silent film? Uh, yeah, actually, can you imagine making it? No, I don't think you would because unfortunately you would alienate a large portion of your audience, people who have just either never seen a silent movie or can't handle the fact that a movie is silent. Put all the sound effects and stuff in, maybe mm. Wally-esque, but not have anyone actually speak and see if the well, film could work. And being in, in colour, maybe not black and white, would yeah. potentially yeah. show certain things maybe a little differently, I, yeah. I don't know. But you're right, your overacting would have to... Keep yeah, you have to tone that down a little bit. Yeah. yeah, I think the story, if it was remade, it could work very, very well. I mean, it, it may be classed as unoriginal by today's standards. You go, oh, we've seen all this before. But that's not. No, it's not a big deal either. There, but uh, and that's just one example of silent movies yeah. from that era. And the very yeah. first sci-fi film too, if I remember. No, it's the second no, actually. Yeah. Yeah, oh. Trip to the Moon was yep. the first one. So which so, I can't sorry, pronounce. Sorry, sci-fi feature film. My understanding, because that's feature length film. Feature length, feature length film. yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not fine. the first sci-fi, but yeah. the feature length one. Sorry. Yeah, exactly right. Because a lot of people think, oh, because it's a silent movie, it's going to be done on the cheap, as you know, Claire was suggesting. That actually, the quality is actually mm -hmm. very, very good, and they actually do have close-ups and good editing and all yeah. the rest of it. I mean, film was um, uh, filmmaking actually jumped very, very quickly in those early uh, decades, from say from 1907 to 1927. It was a complete leaps and bounds, mm -hmm. and so by the time we got to 27, uh, right on the verge of where they introduced talkies. Uh, there, that was a really, really um, good quality and well worth having a look at. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I'm just putting it out to you. So, if you haven't seen Metropolis, uh, by all means, give it a go. Okay, don't discount it just because it is silent. Okay, so there you go. And if you do get this chance to listen to the Giorgio, Giorgio Morota soundtrack, the music is outstanding. What can I say? Anyway, that actually brings us to the end of the episode. If you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell for all the latest and greatest updates. Next week is our final episode for the season and we're bringing in a special dude someone who's going to join us at this table <gasps> it's very exciting stuff what can i say so in the interim make sure you do as this dude is doing and staying in the zone okay no worries we will speak to you soon and uh bye for now <laughs>